Good morning, everyone. Just a couple of announcements uh, this week. Um, this Wednesday, um, we're going to have a prayer meeting, and it's going to be a little bit longer than uh, maybe you're used to. I don't know. But it starts at 6 o'clock on Wednesday evening, and it will go until 11 o'clock. And come and go, like I understand, you may not be able to come for long, but if you can come for half an hour, if you can come for the whole time, that would be even greater. And it's actually prayer and fasting, so if you, uh, I just want to say something about fasting. Fasting is not you making some great sacrifice that God looks down and says, oh, that's impressive. Okay, fasting is simply setting aside more time to pray, to focus on the Lord. So if you can forgo supper on Wednesday evening, and you will not die from that I'm pretty sure and uh, just focus on prayer individually and if you can't make it then pray at home uh, but come and we're going to gather around God's word and we're going to pray and seek the Lord we need a move of God in our communities and in our in our world and uh, the answer is prayer the answer is to come to God so that's what we're going to do so, yeah, that's this coming Wednesday night. Also on Wednesday, uh, starting at quarter past three till 4.30, Kids Club is starting up. So, so um, yep, if you're uh, Anthony's age, you're good. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Kids Club from quarter past three to 4.30, and you get there when you can. And uh, if you have children under five, they're welcome to come as long as you come with them or a caregiver. And uh, yeah, so it's exciting to get started with that as well. So those are two major announcements, I think. I don't know if I have any others right at the moment. Yes, oh yes, a men's prayer breakfast this coming Saturday morning. So, busy week. Uh, this Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, come and uh, fill your tummy, and uh, we'll also be spending time before the Lord in prayer. So that's at 8 o'clock this Saturday morning coming. The youth. Youth. Uh, oh, yes. The youth are going to Margarita next Saturday, this Saturday, too. Saturday evening, right? Okay, maybe Saturday afternoon for the youth group. Uh, you, to be announced. TBA. I think that's it there. Well, let's stand and sing. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe in veils below let all our strength be heard faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world faith is the victory faith is the victory oh glorious victory that overcomes the world His banner over us is love Our sword, the word of God We tread the road, the saints above With shouts of triumph trod By faith they like a whirlwind's breath Swept on o'er every field the faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread. be left behind and onward to the fray salvation's helmet on each head with truth all burnt about the earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout faith is the victory faith 
is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raven shall be given. Before the angels they shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of faith, for the privilege of believing, Lord, of trusting, of looking to you, Lord. And so we ask of you, O oh God, for your mercy and grace upon us, Lord, that we might, we might believe the faithful one, that we might, Lord, trust in a God who is faithful. Thank you, Lord, that faithfulness starts with you, O oh God, and that our hope of being faithful is found in you as well. So draw us near, O Lord, and show us the necessity of faith today as we walk by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Faithful one, so unchanging. Ageless one, you're my Again and again, I call out to you. Again and again, you are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me. You lift me. 
Okay, you got to participate in this song, okay? It might be, it's new to you. But, but you notice, if you go to the chorus, go down to the next one. He's our rescuer. You have to shout, hey, and raise your hand to the Lord, okay? He's our rescuer, hey. He's our rescuer, hey. We are free from sin forevermore. Okay, we'll give it a try, see what happens. Let's we'll start at the top. There is good news for the captive, good news for the shame. I think probably hand clapping will help in this song too, okay? So you can try that too. And then, yeah, okay. Start again. There is good news for the captive, good news for the shame. There's good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion fed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our rescuer, hey! He's our rescuer, hey! We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, hey! Oh, how grace abounds, hey, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. He is beauty for the black man, riches for the poor. He is friendship to the one the world ignores. He is pasture for the weary, rest for those who strive. For the good Lord is the way, the truth, and life. Yes, the good Lord is the way, the truth, and life. He's our rescuer, hey! He's our rescuer, hey! We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, hey! Oh, how grace abounds, hey! We'll praise the Lord, our rescuer. Oh, oh. Oh, how grace of God. 
a seat. That was a fun song, isn't it? But a true song. Hallelujah. The faithful rescuer. Thank you, Jesus. How awesome is the Lord Most High. I think Leonard has a song for us. Oh, Gord, do you have one ready? No, Leonard. Has. Okay. I'm going to do a song called The Scarlet Purple Robe. <laughs> There's a story so unkind In the holy book we find And it tells how Jesus stood alone one day False accused and condemned Yet they found no fault with him the man who wore the scarlet purple robe purple robe my savior wore oh the pain for me he bore as he stood alone forsaken on that day and they played upon his head piercing thorns of blood and dread his raiment was a scarlet purple robe in the common judgment hall he was mocked and scorned by all as the tears of sorrow fell upon his cheek. Soldiers of the wicked men smote him with their evil hands. The man who wore the scarlet purple robe. My Savior wore Oh, the pain for me he bore As he stood alone forsaken On that day And they placed upon his head Piercing thorns of blood and red His rain was a scarlet purple robe words of truth that they were plain from the lips of Pilate came in this man I find no reason he should die and the and cry let him now be crucified the man who wore the scarlet purple robe purple robe my savior wore oh the pain for me he bore as he stood alone for upon his head piercing thorns of blood and red his raiment was a scarlet purple robe yes his raiment was a scarlet purple robe thank you morning oh what a beautiful day <laughs> beautiful October it's been wonderful hope I see Lammy coming hey Millie how are you doing hey not too bad Lammy what's up with you well I, I'm, I'm I, I don't know what to do what do you mean 
Well, the farmer, you know, we had some trouble with our water. Yeah, that's right. We had bad water and there wasn't enough of it. So, the farmer put in a new well. Yay, I know, we put in a brand new well. He dug the well way down in the ground. Yep. And then he put a nice tap at the burn. Yep. But there's a problem. What's the problem? I can't get any water out of the tap. Really? Yes, I turn the tap on this way, I turn it that way, not one drop of water. Well, don't you know why? No, the well is over there, the tap is over here, and there's no water. And I looked, I went to the well. You did? Yes, I looked down in the well. It's deep. Oh, I wouldn't want to, yeah, I wouldn't want to fall in there. Okay, uh, and was there any water in it? It was full of water. It was so full of water that if a poor little sheep like me fell in, I'd drown right away. Hey, how you doing, Hadriel? Yeah? <laughs> really? Oh, boy. So what's, uh, what's go... Well, oh, I know. D is there a ditch between the well and the, um, and the <laughs> tap? Yes, there is a ditch, and it's open. Okay. Well, was there a pipe in the ditch? No! Why would you need a pipe? You got a well, you got a tap, you don't need a pipe. Okay, Hadriel, you go sit down now. Go sit down. Thank you. Well, I don't know. Well, why would you want to even have to have a, t a, 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 a pipe? You don't need a pipe. You got a well, you got a tap. All you got to do is turn the tap on and get the water, and I can't get the water. It's because the pipe isn't put in yet. The pipe? What's the pipe got to do with it? Well, the water has to go from the well all the way over to the tap. If there's no pipe, then the water can't get there. Oh. Oh, you mean I can't get any water from the tap because there's no pipe? Yep, it doesn't matter how good the well is, doesn't matter how good the tap is, you have to have a pipe in between. You can ask Mark Poirier about that. He does some plumbing. He knows. Okay, well that makes sense. I never thought about it that way. Yeah, it's like, it's like in the Bible. Now how in the world can a pipe be like something in the Bible? Well, it's like God wants us to believe in Him. God is over here, we're over here, but we don't get anything if we don't have faith. Oh, so faith is like the pipe. Yep, without the pipe, you can't get any water without faith. You can't get any blessing from God. That makes sense. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to talk to the farmer. Well, I'm sure he's just... Oh, I heard something. He was waiting to get some pipe in because uh, sometimes the co-op doesn't have everything. Oh, really? Yeah. Or, yeah, so he had to order pipe in. Okay. All right. Well, then the pipe comes in, then we'll be good. Yep. Yeah. But it's no good just to put the pipe in the burn. No, it has to go in the ditch and has to be attached to the well and attached to the tap. That's right. Just like faith has to be attached to God and to us. Well, that makes good sense. Well, that helps me to understand about faith more. I want to trust God so that I can walk in His blessings. Just like a pipe goes from the well to the tap. You've got it. Well, I can't wait to turn on that tap and get some delicious water. Yeah, it'll be cool, won't it? Well, I'm going to come over and we're going to have a really long drink of water. That's a pretty long drink of water. It sure is. How about a long drink of milk? Oh, yeah. Sounds good. Okay, everybody. You know, make sure you got a pipe going from your well, but make sure you have faith in God. Sounds like a plan. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Well, let's stand and sing forever. Give thanks to the Lord. Our God and King, His love endures forever, for He is good. 
He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. His love endures forever. But for the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing To the setting sun, his love endures forever, and by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing. Well, this morning uh, we're continuing on from last week's message, or was it two weeks ago? Last week was Thanksgiving. And last uh, time we were together in Hebrews chapter 11, we talked about the foundation of faith. Faith's focus. And faith's focus is the facts. Do you remember? Facts, faith, and then feelings. So often we have these reversed and we end up in trouble. God calls us to know that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. It has to be rooted in reality. It's a crazy world we're living in today because people are saying, well, I am whatever, whether they are or whether they're not. They are no longer living in a real world. They're making up things in their mind and thinking, that's who I am. And as a result of that, we have mass confusion. And I fear for our children. I fear for this generation because they won't know who they are or what they are because they are not living in a root of reality. And friends, that is uh, a mark of our society in many ways. People think that they can say something and that makes it true. It doesn't. Truth remains true. It always will remain true. You have to have substance. You have to have evidence. You cannot start from the place of no substance and no evidence and come up with faith in something and declare something true because then you're, you're, it's completely unreal. Now often Christians have been accused of having a kind of faith that has no reality or substance, but as we have seen and as we will continue to see, we are rooted in real substance and rooted in real evidence and reality. There is reality in the hand of God, in the creation of God, in the presence of God, in the person of God. There is, it's not a fairy tale by any means. Today I want to talk about the necessity of faith. How important it is to have faith. And sometimes wrapped up in this idea of faith probably it comes a definition. And, and, the, and the definition that we saw earlier, the fact that it was substance, 
of things hoped for. That is, though it's substance, we still have hope in it. We, we look towards evidence of things not seen. Though we don't see it, we believe it because it's real, because it's true. You can't see air, but you try and go out in outer space and try to live without it. You might not see something, but that doesn't mean it's not true. It doesn't mean it's not real. And faith, even though we don't see God visually, uh, though at times there have been visions of God, I remember having at least one in my life where I had a vision of Jesus Christ, but I don't have a vision of Jesus Christ every day, and that doesn't mean I don't believe he's there. Uh, the evidence of his presence, the evidence of his power, the evidence of his person is all around me. It's around me in creation, it's around me in his work, in his ministry, it's around me in the impossibility of so-called chance circumstances that uh, I have seen over and over again the hand of God moving in my life and in the lives of others. But the necessity of faith is laid out in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says this, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. It's not possible to please God without faith. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So we have this statement here in Hebrews 11.6. Now it jumps a couple of verses and I'm going to go back to those verses but I want to talk about the necessity of faith and this is the outline of that. This is the verse that teaches the necessity of faith. It says it's impossible to please God without faith. Um, Greta, Greta what was her last name? Uh, was it? Yeah. Os prosper, prosper, I can't remember her last name, and I said, I must remember this name. Anyway, she was a minister in the United Church of Canada, and about five or six years ago, she decided that uh, uh, she was an atheist. So here she's a minister in the church, and she says, I have declared that I'm an atheist. I don't believe there's a personal God. I don't believe in the Holy Spirit. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I don't believe in the Father. I don't believe there's a God at all. Well, it caused, a, it, it caused a stir, even in the United Church. And they began to uh, you know, say, well, you, if you don't believe in God, what are you doing as a pastor in the United Church? So they had a confab with her, and in the end, they struck a deal. Yeah, you can keep on pastoring, even though you don't believe in God. So where do you go with that, right? So if you don't believe that he is, that's what it says here. First of all, in order to have faith, you have to believe that he is. Does that make sense, doesn't it? you got to believe that there is a God. Now, a lot of people can pass that litmus test, even though Greta didn't pass it. But lots of people pass that litmus test. At least they say, I know there's a God. However, to say that I believe that he is might be a little bit misleading because I could say, I believe there's a God, but it's my, my, my dog or it's my tree over there, or it's my lamp, or, or uh, it's, uh, it's not a person, it's, it's just a, a force. May the force be with you. But that's not God. It must believe that He is. When it says He is, He's talking about the God that is re revealed to us in the scriptures. He's talking about the God who is the creator of heaven and earth. He's talking about a God who is a personal being and a God who is righteous, a God who is holy, a God who loves, but a God who judges sin, a God who is perfect in every way. So this is what he speaks of here when it says, for it, to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. And so the vague word or the vague idea that there is a God somewhere is not enough. You must believe that He is, that He exists, the God of the Word of God, the God of creation all around us, a God who is an intelligent being, a God who is not subject to your whims nor fancies, and not a God whom you can say, well, God, this is what I want you to do today, and you better get it done but a God who has all authority, all power, all might, and who is all loving, and yet who is all holy. <coughs> so we have words that says, don't fear him who can kill the body. 
but cannot kill the soul. But fear him rather who has authority or power to cast both body and soul into hell. That's the same God where the Bible says God is love. Why? How do they go together? They go together because God hates sin. That's the God of the Bible. He hates sin. Why does he hate sin so much? Because he sees the results of it. And we don't. Sadly, we often excuse sin. We make allowances for it. We, we, we push it aside a bit. We say, well, that's not so bad. This is not so bad. My goodness, the sin that was committed by the human race at the beginning in Adam and Eve was simply to disobey God once. Didn't seem that serious. Everybody here that has disobeyed God at least once in your life, raise your hand. If I see a hand down, I'm going to come after you. <laughs> because you just sinned. That's all they did. Once they rebelled. Once they sinned. And the human race fell into sin. And one sin always leads to another and another and another. And look where we are today. Look what sin has done. So, is this God just and fair to punish sin? Absolutely. Can he allow sin into his heaven? You've heard me say this before. If God allowed one sin into heaven, what would heaven be like? It would be just the same mess we have here. He's not going to allow one sin into his heaven. And that's a problem. That's a problem for you and me. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the great, majestic love of God in sending His Son, Jesus Christ, into this world to be your Savior and mine. Yes, the God must believe that He is. Jesus Christ is God. He's not half God. He's not one quarter God. He is God. In the beginning was the Word, which is a title for Jesus, and the Word was with God, John chapter 1, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God, pardon me. The Word was God. And he is God in every way. The Bible teaches without Jesus Christ there's nothing made that was made. In Isaiah 44, chapter 44, it tells us that God spread abroad the earth and the heavens alone. He said, I did it by myself. If God did it by himself and Jesus is the creator of all things, what does that make Jesus? It makes him God. You must believe that he is. We can't just come along and say, oh yeah, you know, I believe in God, I believe in God, I believe in God, but you don't even know who he is. You have a God co constructed in your own mind, and you put your faith in that kind of God, and you have nothing. God does not made up in your mind. He's a real person. You know, sometimes people get into relationships, and they think, oh, this is Mr. Right or Miss Right, this is the one, this is the one, until they get to know them. And then it's like, oh, oh, I made a mistake. I took a left turn when I should have took a right. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes that's how we are. We create our own idea of who God is, and we think this is fine, and we're going to carry on this way. And you can't live the Christian life with that kind of God. You can't. You need the God of the Bible. You must believe that he is. That's not light. That's not a small thing. He's talking about the God of the Bible. He's talking about Jesus Christ and who he really is and what the consequences are if we don't trust him and what the consequences are if we do. So not only must we believe that he is, that's the starting point, but the devil knows God, doesn't he? Yeah, he was created by God. He rebelled against God. He's been around for thousands of years. I would venture to say he knows more about God, the God of the Bible, than you do. Would I be safe in assuming that? Yes. I think so. He does. So he knows who God is, and he knows a lot about God. And so it's not just enough to believe that he is. Even if you believe in the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ, and the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and you believe the Bible is true, and you believe all those things, you could still, still be outside of grace, still not exercising faith. 
Because faith has to start with facts, and the facts are who God is, yes. But it doesn't stop at just the facts. Just as much as I said that it was rooted in reality, there is a, a deeper place that faith takes you. Not just knowing that things are true. The book of James, he writes this, and he says, You believe in God, you do well. That's the right thing to do. But he says this, but the devil also believes and he trembles. And that was the challenge that he write, that James writes to them because an empty faith is not true faith. There is a faith that's empty. It's a faith that just believes that these things are true. But it's not a faith where you actually step out and trust where you actually submit and surrender, where you actually allow faith, the faith that puts your faith, trust in God, your dependence upon God is exercised. When that happens, guess what comes out of that? Does anybody know? What does it produce? Christ in you. I'm sorry? Christ in you. Christ in you, yeah. It produces good works. It produces works. F real faith always produces works. You're not saved by works. You're saved by faith. But it's a faith that produces works. A faith that produces nothing is not salvation. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's not saying you're saved by works. I don't believe that for a second. You are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. But when you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone, he's going to produce something in your life. He must. If I'm trusting Christ, what's Christ going to do? Nothing? No, he's not a nothing God. He's an active God. He's a doing God. Praise God. And really, if you look at the whole of the faith chapter, you will see that by faith, they did something. Isn't that true? Yeah. We'll go through all of these here. We're going to go through them. I don't know how long it's going to take, but we're going to go through the, the heroes of faith. And we're going to see every time by faith, they did something. But they did something because they rested in the finished work of Jesus Christ. They did something because they depended upon God. And as we depend upon him, then it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Then it's the presence of God. It's the power of God. And it's the person of God living out through me. And as a result of that, good works come. Deeds come. We do something. So it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I love this passage because it says it challenges us that there is, it is worthwhile to pursue God. Faith pursues God. Faith does not just say, okay, I believe it's all true, thank you very much and carry on with life, but it becomes your life's mission, it becomes your heart's desire, it becomes your passion to seek God, to diligently seek God. What does that mean? Diligently. Yeah, it means that you're, you're focused, right? It doesn't mean, yeah, maybe some days I'll pray or whatever, that kind of thing. It doesn't mean that. It's vitally important to see that. We're going to come back to this again. I just want to give you that illustration as I spoke with the, with the puppet show this morning, that there's a tap where the, so all the blessing of God comes, and then there's the well, who God is the very source of, and then there's the pipeline, faith. Without faith, you see there's no connection. Without faith, I do not experience the blessing of God, the life of God. I don't experience it. But with faith, I do. So I want you to know that faith is not fatalism. Fatalism is the idea, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours, you see. Que sera, sera. That isn't faith. That is fatalism. What I mean by that, that is, well, Whatever's going to be is going to be. And I'll just do whatever I'm doing. That is indifference to God. 
And uh, don't mistake fatalism for faith. Faith is where I trust God. You see, fatalism, I have seen fatalism at deathbeds. They're resigned to die. They have no choice but to die. And so they just give up and die. That's not faith. Sometimes there is a sort of peace that happens when people die, but that's not the peace of God that passes understanding. It's a peace that's just based on, I give up. I'm done. But then there's a faith that says, I'm in the arms, sheltered in the arms of God. And there's a great difference. There's a great hope, there's a great peace, and there's a great joy. I remember a lady who was dying of brain cancer in the Inverness Hospital. And she wanted us to all come in and sing songs, sing hymns. And so we did. We were in that room, it was a private room, and we were singing to the Lord. And she loved the old hymns, and we sung one after the other, and had prayer and praise, and it was glorious. And this was a lady who had wasted many years. She had heard the gospel as a young person and kind of walked away from God. But in her last years, a few years before she contracted brain cancer, she came to the Lord in a mighty way and loved Jesus and just was rejoicing in the Lord. Well, one of the nurses out at the desk, she was livid. She was angry. And she said to another one of them, she said, what's wrong with those people in there? Don't they know that woman is dying? And they're in there singing. What's wrong with them? She couldn't see it all. And of course, the, the answer came back to her. That's what she wants. She's singing with them. But she just couldn't see that at all, right? So faith is something that carries us in the deepest places, in the darkest holes, because we're trusting in the living God. You see, it's not the, the faith itself. It's the object of our faith, the person of our faith. Faith is just a pipe. I'm not trying to glorify faith, but it, it's a necessity. Does that make sense? Yeah. I want to glorify God. Faith is just the means to trust. So it's not fatalism, it's not resignation, but it's trust, it's dependence, and it creates a response. It creates a response. It must create a response. God changes people's lives when they trust Him. He does. He's awesome. He's powerful. And when, he, when we put our faith and trust in Him, when we rely on Him, something happens in our life. Something changes. And my friend, if nothing is changing, check and see if the pipe is laid. Because you might just be someone who says, I believe all that is true. Oh, yes, I know it's true. I, would, I brought up knowing that. I know it's all true. I believe, I believe there's a God. I believe in Jesus. I believe all those things. But if there is no response in your heart, if your heart is continually cold, you need to find out if there's a pipe there at all. If there's true faith being exercised, because faith is meant to be exercised. I could talk a lot about faith, and I'm going to in the next few weeks still, because it isn't so much quantity, but quality. And quality will eventually produce more quantity. But there has to be genuine faith. So. Check your foundations. Make sure that your faith is in Jesus Christ, not just for knowing who he is, but to actually be trusting who he is. And if you're not trusting, then you miss the point altogether. And sadly, I believe there are many that find themselves in that place, and they will be surprised on the day of judgment because Jesus said many will say in that day and find out, you part from me, you worker of sin. The Bible says the just have to live by faith shall live by his faith. You see, faith causes us to live differently. If we are not living by faith, then it's probably true we are not actually trusting God, even for salvation sometimes. Now, we can all slip and fall. Don't misunderstand me. We can all go down pretty hard roads as believers, and God in his mercy pursues us. But he brings us back to the place where we actually trust him. And so I'm not here to judge anybody about anything. 
I am here to say we should check our foundations and see where we are. Habakkuk 2.4, this is quoted three times in the New Testament from the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. It says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now what is the opposite of faith according to this passage? What is it? Pride. Pride. <laughs> An independent spirit. Someone who is proud and puffed up in their cells, it says his soul is not upright in him. It's wrong because there is a denial of God, denial of who he is, denial of his power, denier, denial of his right to ownership of your life. And so pride will come where faith is not present. A proud and haughty heart will be there because it was, it's always a statement, I don't need you, God. Or, okay, God. I'll allow you, imagine, I'll allow you this little corner of my life and this corner. But you can't have it all, God, because I don't trust you. I don't trust you. That is the heart of it. You know, in the book of Hebrews, it says they didn't enter into the blessing of God because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief. Unbelief is that the sin of all sins in one respect because every other sin comes out of unbelief everything else comes out of unbelief because the just shall live by his faith now what that tells you is that the way that you are just is because you are living by faith it doesn't say because I'm just I live by faith It's because I live by faith that I am just that's the, 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 the key that's in there and so we have it repeated three times in the New Testament. Romans 1.17. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That is in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11. No one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. That is, you cannot be justified in the sight of God by doing the work of the law. By trying to be the best person that you can be. You see, if I think I'm going to be saved by trying to be the best person I can be, that's not faith. That's me. That's pride. That's pride saying, I am good enough, and I can be good enough to be saved. You cannot be good enough to be saved. It's impossible. You need the goodness of God. And so you live by faith, by dependence upon Him. Hebrews 10, 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This is it, friends. It's faith. It's always by faith. So there's a couple of examples in closing that are given actually before this definition. And one of them is Abel. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. Now we're going a long way back here with Abel. We're going back to the book of Genesis. And we know that there was a Cain and there was an Abel, two brothers. And both of them uh, had an awareness of God. They also had an awareness they had to bring a sacrifice to God. Now it doesn't tell us God had told them you have to bring a sacrifice or anything like that. But obviously they had learned from Adam and from Eve and as well from God himself that they needed to bring a sacrifice. And I'm sure that God was explicit because he usually is about what kind of sacrifice was needed. It had to be a blood sacrifice. But what happens? Cain brought, he was a tiller of the, the ground, so he brought his turnips and his carrots and his peas and his onions. And he brought those to the Lord and he said, Lord, here's my offering to you. Well, it makes sense. I mean, that's what he worked at. Abel, he was a keeper of sheep, so he brought a blood sacrifice. He brought a lamb. Sacrifice the lamb. Well, you would think, well, come on, God. Cain brought what he did for, you know, it's just the best he could do, and he brought it to him. But God didn't accept Cain's sacrifice. Why? Because God had made it clear, you need to bring a blood sacrifice. Why was that? Because it was, it was a sin offering. It was an offering for our, our, their sin. 
And that's why it says here, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. You see? It was a more excellent sacrifice. Because it was the right sacrifice. What Cain needed to do was to go to Abel and say, I'll trade you some veggies for one of them lambs. But no, he said, I'm bringing my best to God. I'm bringing what i done for God. I'm bringing it to you, God. God says, I don't need what you do for me. What you need is a blood sacrifice for your sin. What you need is what I have prescribed. So once again, you see, faith has to operate in the place of truth. It has to operate in the place where God says it does. It operates in the place where I trust God. So by faith, by trusting God, Abel took the right sacrifice then came more excellent. And he obtained a witness that he was righteous. And God testifying of his gifts. And through it, he being dead, still speaks. You see, God testified of the gifts that he brought. That testimony still stands. The blood that was offered in the, in the blood sacrifice by Abel was a testimony of the coming blood sacrifice of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. God doesn't make mistakes. So what are you going to bring to God? You're going to bring your works to God? You're going to bring what you think to God? And you're going to call that faith? Don't bother. You need to bring what God requires. And my friend, what God requires is the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There's no other. So praise the Lord that we can see there, by faith, Abel knew what it was to exercise true faith. And the other example given here is by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. It's remarkable. There's only two people that we know of that went through this. Besides, well, Jesus tasted death. Enoch and Elijah. Enoch was translated. He didn't see death. He was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony. What? He pleased God. That he pleased God. By faith, Enoch. By faith, by faith, Abel, he pleased God. He pleased God by faith, by trusting God, by dependence upon God. The righteousness that we live, if we live any righteousness at all, is a righteousness that's lived by faith. It's by dependence on God. It's not what you do for God in, a, in one respect. It's what God does for you by faith. And as God does for you by faith, then you live it out. And you do. So faith causes us, as we saw earlier in the verse that was given here in uh, the, uh, Hebrews 11.6. Faith causes us to believe and to seek Him. Diligently seek Him. It causes us to go for it. It causes us to realize, hey, this is the most important thing in life. This is what I'm going for. You know, some people say, oh, well, yeah, but that doesn't sound like God wants to reward you if you, you know, if you believe. Listen, why do we do things that we do? Why do you go to work? Why do you go to work, Gary? I mean, you mean, I know you probably really love your job. Is that the only reason why you go to work? The pay is helpful, Pierre. What's that? The pay is helpful. The pay is helpful? <laughs> would everybody agree with that when you go to work? Yeah. How many people would love to go to work and not get paid? <laughs> yeah? Come on, Haley, no. how about it, right? Just baking at the co-op. Oh, I'm doing this because I love it. Oh, don't give me the paycheck. I don't need that, right? You're looking for uh, something, right? There's a, there's a reward at the other end of that. And that's not a, a, an abnormal thing, is it? No. We seek, diligently serve God, and we will be rewarded as a result of that. And that is not like, uh, oh yeah, I got more, you know, this, more of that. But rather, I have more of you, Lord. That I have a relationship with you. That I can be a blessing to others. It's a reward to be a blessing to others as well. It's, it's wonderful. If God gives you provision, then look for a way to bless others with it. It's more blessed to give than to receive. I believe that by faith. I believe that is true. And so... Jesus challenges in Matthew 7, 7, he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Diligently seek him. There's diligence here. There's going forward here. I mean, look, if you lost 
if, if your child got lost in the woods, what would you do? What would you be doing? What would be the priority of your life? Oh, the hockey game's on tonight. I think I'll watch it. Would it be? Your whole focus, your whole passion would be, I must find my child. Am I right? And you hope to be rewarded by finding your child. Isn't that right? Well, I want to challenge you. Is God, is the Lord, are the things of God more important than the other stuff of life? Do you live that way? Every day? I wonder. Am I challenging you? I'm challenging myself. Faith is to be lived, friends. And it is a daily dependence. It is diligently seeking God. That's how you live by faith. It is not, okay, Sarah. <coughs> it's not indifference. You know, Jesus gave an example in Matthew 13, 45. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. When he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Yes, this can be a picture of Jesus being the merle, uh, the merle merchant. I say words back, letters back or something. The pearl merchant. Yes, it could be a picture of Jesus looking for beautiful pearls and finding you. And it is that. But it's the other way around as well. It is you to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You're looking for the pearl of great price. And who is, what's the pearl of great price? The Lord Jesus himself. And what, when they discovered that pearl of great price, they went and sold all that he has and he bought it. It was more important than anything else in life. And I challenge you, Jesus Christ is more important than anything else in life. Away with all your little selfish ideas and selfish directions and everything else. Stop and take a look at your life. Are you truly living by faith? Or is it a sham? My challenge to you is, the just shall live by faith. And so when we consider the faith chapter, I want to encourage you, maybe I haven't done that, maybe I've whacked you over the head a bit, playing whack-a-mole with you. But I want you to wake up to what it really means to live by faith. You know, if you're looking and say, oh, I know, you know, this, I know this, per this person's really following the Lord. Uh, not like I am, but they are following the Lord. Get up off your duff and follow Jesus. Put him first in your heart, in your life. Cry out to him. Say, Lord, here I am. Lord, I, I'm not telling you that you can do this. I'm telling you that if you trust God, he will do this. If you'll take one step towards Jesus, he'll take a thousand towards you. The father came running for the prodigal, didn't he? He didn't wait till he got there. He didn't scold him. He took him in his arms and he just clothed him. The guy couldn't even finish the sentence about all the wrong things that he had done. The Lord is so willing to love you and to lavish his blessing on you. You think he wants to withhold blessing from us? No, he wants to pour blessing in your life. I've told you this before, you can have as much of God as you want. My question to you is how much of God do you want? Oh, maybe a little corner. You never, never lose by embracing the Lord by living by faith. So that's my challenge to you today. There's a necessity of faith to be operated in your lives and in mine. It's a necessity. It's a necessity to be saved, but it's also a necessity for Christian living. It has to be always living by faith. May God grant you grace and mercy and strength to come to him and diligently seek him. Maybe this morning you need to say, Lord, forgive me. I have not been living by faith. The Lord is not going to kick you out for that. He's going to embrace you and say, okay, let's go from here. Let's go from here. That's the kind of God he is. He's the God of the millionth chance. Maybe you're on your 999,999th. He still has another if you'll come. That's the wonder of who he is. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness and mercy. And thank you for the grace that you've so abundantly shed and pour out on us, Lord. 
Lord, we have all experienced the goodness of God. And yet, Lord, sometimes we have missed much of the goodness of God because we have not lived by faith. So forgive us, God, and bring us, Lord, to a place where we believe that you are who you are and that we diligently seek you. And that, Lord, we might be those who live by faith. The results of it are startling. They're powerful. They're amazing. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with a song. It's called Let's Go to Jesus. As I've said many times, uh, after the service, if you need prayer, and if you need to, uh, to come and get right with God, you need, yeah, just talk to me. I I'll pray with you. I'll come with you before the throne. Let's go to Jesus. Don't miss doing that. Show him our hearts, show him our pain, show him our scars. Let's go to Jesus, together we'll meet and lay all our burdens at Jesus' feet. Sure, I have cried, we both have known pain, we're really no different, really the same. Sure, we've been hurt, so has he, oh look on his face now, what do you see? Love in his eyes. And scars in his hands All that he suffered Was part of his plan Freely he'll give All that we need Praise him forever And bow at his feet So let's go to Jesus And show him our hearts Show him our pain and show him our scars. Yeah, let's go to Jesus. Together we'll meet and lay all our burdens at Jesus' feet. Sure, I have faith. So have you. And now we reason. What shall we do? Sure, I've been down. We all felt that way. Where is the answer? What can I say? Let's go to Jesus. Show Him our hearts. Show Him our pain. Show Him our scars. 
Let's go to Jesus, together we'll meet. Lay all our burden at Jesus' feet. Oh, Father, we're a weak bunch, Lord. Oh, God, how we need you. How we acknowledge our desperate need of you every moment of every breath of our lives, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, where we've looked away from you. Forgive us for our pride and our arrogance. And draw us back to the place, Lord, where you are all. Where we trust you, where we pursue you, where we walk with you. So that we might be the men and women of faith that are needed in this generation. Oh, we cry out to you for that, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we're having the opportunity to have a meal together today. We ask you to bless our food and bless our fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please stay for lunch. If you didn't bring any food, come and eat anyway. We believe in the loaves and the fishes. There's enough. <laughs>